Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Triangles Meditation Group. Today is August 2nd, 2021. And as we've been doing, let's just begin by a brief, having a brief moment of silence to link with the worldwide group of triangles. We know, O oh Lord, of life and love about the need. Touch our hearts anew with love that we too may love and give. So the purpose of these weekly webinars is to introduce the work of triangles to people who are new to it and to aid them in the forming of triangles so that we can increase the network of lighted triangles that surrounds the planet, thereby contributing to our overall task of helping to make the planet a sacred planet. And we also come together for those of us who are already members of triangles to participate in a meditative visualization in the support and strengthening of the planetary network. Triangles is a simple visualization technique using the power of thought and prayer to uplift and transform planetary consciousness. The work involves the establishing of a line of lighted loving communication between three people who agree to work together each day to vivify their triangular link, working together as a triangle of light, mentally, spiritually, and in a spirit of goodwill to all humanity. Their triangle is then placed within the larger framework of the planetary network of triangles. And as the network is visualized, the great invocation a world prayer is sounded as a perfect means of distributing the energies of light, love, and power into the consciousness of humanity, touching all open hearts and minds that can respond to st spiritual stimulation when it's released into the atmosphere. The work of triangles only takes a few minutes each day and it can therefore be fit into even the busiest of schedules. After our meditation today, we're fortunate to have sharing from one of our coworkers in the Lucis Trust of London, Simon Marlowe. Many of you will be familiar with Simon and he's going to speak to us on joy. So we really look forward to hearing from him shortly. So as we do each week at this point, let's work together in a brief meditative alignment. Let's visualize the planet as a sphere of lighted energy. And within that sphere, visualize a triangle composed of three points, the three primary planetary centers, Shambhala, planetary head center, the spiritual hierarchy, the planetary heart, and humanity, the planetary throat center. Visualize these three centers as spheres of light radiating and merging one with the other, filling the triangle with light. And now within the center of that triangle, visualize a five pointed star. This is the star of the world teacher, blending east and west, past and future, 
filling the triangle with light. At each point of the star, the sphere of his activity stands an outpost of his consciousness, the five planetary centers. And visualize these points radiating out through the five points of London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, Tokyo, Visualize these outpouring energies enlivening small groups gathering everywhere, aiding them to focus and direct the energies into the consciousness of all humanity, solving its problems, creating right human relations, restoring peace on earth. Sound together the mantra, projecting a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy. Radiance, we are in power. We stand forever with our hands stretched out, linking the heavens and the earth, the inner world of meaning and the subtle world of glamour. We reach into the light and bring it down to meet the need. We reach into the silent place and bring from thence the gift of understanding. Thus with the light we work and turn the darkness into day. I wanted to focus today briefly on some comments related to the energies of Leo because we know that this year we have the special opportunity of having the first Leo full moon occur at the very beginning of the sign of Leo and the upcoming second Leo full moon at the very closing of that energy. And so therefore the new moon which will occur in a week or so, will occur at the midpoint of the, those two energies. So therefore at the midpoint of the sign of Leo. And as you can imagine, the midpoint between two powerful poles is an exceedingly powerful point. So all three of these lunations, the first full moon, the new moon, and the second full moon, are potent uh, releases of this energy of Leo. So Leo, as we know, stands at a particularly uh, critical point in our planetary history at this time as we enter into the Aquarian age. 
for it is the polar opposite of that sign. And so from one perspective, the pairs of opposites esoterically, as we've often mentioned, must merge and blend one with the other. So in Leo, it's really a perfect um, symbol of where humanity stands. For Leo is concerned on one hand with integration, with becoming able to achieve a mental polarization, uniting the three lower vehicles, the etheric, physical, the astral, and the mental vehicles, and standing within the center of the even arm cross, preparing to enter the path of discipleship. So as increasing numbers of people enter into that path of probation, actually, you know, preparing themselves to enter onto the path, there is another group within the planet, the disciples of the world, who are moving towards a higher alignment with the spiritual will. So there's this two groups of individuals, large groupings, who are coming increasingly, we're told, under the influence of Leo. And that's really um, highlighted and symbolized by a triangle that's forming in the heavens. Uh, and it's illustrated here in this little um, diagram. So the two stars that are called the pointers, which are here named Marac and Dubay, form a triangle with Polaris. So the two stars of the Big Dipper on the handle the part, the lower part of the Big Dipper, form a triangle, a cosmic triangle with Polaris, which, as you know, is the North Star, the guiding star at this time in our planetary history, which will change as we move forward, but not for many thousands of years. So this triangle is important, the Tibetan tells us, uh, for what it symbolizes. So I can just briefly describe what we're told in the teachings. The two pointers are both related to the will. Dubé, um, which the Tibetan tells us is a fifth ray star, so it's very much related to that idea of reorientation in, within consciousness, which is aided by Polaris, which we're told is actually the star of reorientation. So it helps. Polaris is the central point of the triangle. It's the soul aspect, we might say. Marak is the aspect of the spiritual will, which comes into play on the path of discipleship. Whereas Dubé, the fifth ray star, is more related to those individuals who are coming under the influence of Polaris for the first time and it helps them to move forward, to take their next step and to come up to the final stages of what's called the mutable cross experience. So it's about, the Tibetan says, it's about the art of refacing and recovering that which has been lost. So Dubé is active, we're told, in the masses of humanity who are moving towards that integration of the lower aspects of the will under this fifth ray influence. And then Marak, which is related to the spiritual will, as I said, comes into play much later on the path of discipleship when the spiritual will begins to be tapped into. And so we can assume that those who are working within the new group of world servers are beginning to respond to that higher influence. And so as I said, this triangle, the Tibetan tells us, should be looked at in all charts of disciples. And what's really interesting to me related to this particular time in planetary history, this particular month, is the fact that we have these two Leo full moons and then the midpoint, as I said, the new moon period is found right in the midpoint of Dubé and Marac in terms of degree. 
So Jubei is generally found to be around 14 degrees of Leo. Marak is found at 18 degrees of the sign Leo. And our, our um, new moon is occurring at 16 degrees of Leo. So this potent triangle is highly stimulated under the influence of this new moon. And therefore this whole month is really powerfully uh, aligning our planet with the pole star. And the Tibetan tells us that the pole star is very related to Leo as well. So not only are the two other points of the pole star, Marak and Dubai, found actually in the sign of Leo, Polaris itself is said to be a major star of direction. So it could be that during this particular month, those of us who seek to align with these important interludes will be able to come into a sense of greater sense of what is the direction that humanity is to take? What is humanity's next step? Perhaps on the inner planes, that guidance can become a little bit more apparent to us. And Polaris in this case, and therefore Leo in this case, is related to the first aspect. We're told the pole star Leo influence governs Shambhala. So it's um, Leo not only brings in the first ray aspect, but it also brings in the second ray with a different alignment of energies. And in fact, when you study the section on triangles in esoteric astrology, you will see how many of the triangles listed, and there are many more, um, are actually formed partially by the sign of Leo. So it's a potent influence at this time. And as I said, helping to usher in this Aquarian age and the shift that's going on within humanity from this centralization in the individual self to a growing realization of the fact that we are moving into an age governed by group work. And there is a, a really powerful passage, I believe from the old commentary, which really describes the shift that's potentially occurring at this time as we move into Aquarius and that will fulfill itself as this age unfolds. So it runs as follows. The lion begins to roar. He rushes forth and in his urge to live, he wields destruction. And then again, he roars and rushing to the stream of life drinks deep. Then having drunk, the magic of the waters works. He stands transformed. The lion disappears, and he who bears the water pot stands forth and starts upon his mission. So let's now move into our meditation. Let's come together in group fusion, achieving a mental polarization at the center of the evened arm cross. Linking together as a soul, as a point of love and light with all those people throughout the world who are working with this triangles meditation group. And we project a line of lighted energy towards center Shambhala and sound the affirmation of will. In the center 
of the will of God I stand. Naught shall deflect my will from his. I implement that will by love. I turn towards the field of service. I, the triangle divine, work out that will within the square and serve my fellow men. Using the creative imagination, link with two other points of light to create a triangle of light. Visualize the triangle in which you are working as an essential part of the radiant worldwide triangles network. Hold the consciousness immersed within the light of the group soul, the heart of love which underlies and infuses the network. Lift your consciousness to the world teacher who stands as the heart of love at the center of the spiritual hierarchy and also at the heart of each triangle. Precipitation, visualize the energies of love, light, and goodwill circulating in and around the triangle's network. Visualize these energies unifying and eliminating all divisions within humanity, healing and transforming human consciousness and establishing right human relationships.
Sounding the mantra of unification, we project a rainbow bridge of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy. The souls of all are one, and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve, and not exact due service. I seek to heal, not hurt. Let pain bring due reward of light and love. Let the soul control the outer form and life and all events and bring to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and insight let the future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavages be gone. Let love prevail. Let all people love. Visualize the whole planet alight with triangles and see new triangles being formed everywhere. Distribution, sounding the great invocation, silently or aloud. And as you repeat each stanza, visualize the network acting as a link between the world of spiritual realities and humanity, as a channel through which light, love, and divine purpose may flow into human consciousness. From the point of light, within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love, within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May the coming one return to earth. from the center of where the will of God is known. Let purpose guide all little human wills, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Ooh. 
PQ. And now I'll ask Simon to unmute yourself and turn on your video. You can do that. Hello, Simon. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Nice to have nice you to be, here. <laughs> nice to be with you. All right. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts on joy. Okay. And I'd first like to say how interesting I thought your um, pondering on Leo was. That was a really wonderful um, sequence of thoughts. Thank you. Um, well, when Kathy asked me to take part in this afternoon's Triangles webinar, I wondered what angle of approach would be most useful and uplifting. And it seemed to me that it would really be a good idea to try and offset the anxieties that are so prevalent in the world today, and which particularly all on a spiritual path must experience with varying degrees of acuteness. A frequent way for many people to deal with these things is to retreat into denial. The ostrich putting his head in the sand. And this, of course, is the road to failure. Another way is to fatalistically accept what seems as inevitable, which in practical terms is a denial of what human intelligent creativity and ingenuity can do. Another way, I think, is to put an unreasonable faith in the hierarchy to wave their magic wand and instantly put everything right. And this is really a denial of the responsibility we all have to put right our mistakes ourselves. I actually wrote a poem about this some years ago. I think it encapsulates the need of humanity to realistically assess the reality of the present world situation in its enormous variety of manifestation and recognize too that it is us, humanity, who are responsible for many of the problems we see. And it's up to us, humanity as a whole, to take action to remedy the situation. The poem is really about the reappearance of the Christ. And he will come again, they say. But they've said this for so many, many centuries of grief. And the cries of butchered children, of slaughtered so-called infidels, of murdered martyrs down the ages ask, is this what you intended? And the superstitious fears of kept closed minds, the rigid orthodoxy of distorted truth, all stand accusing the light that should have been. Do we blame it for going out? Or ourselves for our collective ignorance, our unwillingness to even want to see things as they truly are? But he will come again, they say, and put all right all these things. I'm not convinced. We have to write these things ourselves. And in doing so, the light, our light, will shine and show him then the pathway back to earth can be wisely stepped again. It was that great European mystic, Meister Eckhart, who summed it up beautifully and succinctly. Without me, he said, God is helpless. Humanity exists as an outpost of God, as it were, in order to ground and manifest the divine will in the material world. In more spiritual terms, we, humanity, are the planetary center of creativity. We are learning gradually and painfully that it is love, not selfishness, that must be the motive behind all our activity. When selfishness is the motive, disaster is the result. When love is the motive, then amazing things can and do happen. So we need to be brave and learn to see things as they really are, without that fear-filled anxiety that can so disempower us, or the wishful thinking that generates false hopes. Once we've achieved this stance, 
then we determine to follow our natural and right desire to do what we can to serve the world. One way that we can do this is as responsible, loving and active citizens, whether on the local, national or international level. But we need to add to this the inner work of aspiration and discipleship, for developing the link to the light and love of the soul. As we daily visualize and magnetize this link, we come to realize that this is really the most important part of our service to the world. We are building and guarding humanity's lifeline to the inner spiritual realm of hierarchy. We can see that the many millions of people throughout the world who discovered this in their own lives, especially when they work together, and this is really important, they can sense ideas of the new possibilities that are hovering on the borders between latency and actuality waiting to manifest through the many wonderful group initiatives that we can know about and the many, many more that we sense though do not yet know about in detail. That is where the work we all do in our daily triangles meditation fits in. We're linking up as a world group made up of people from all different faiths and spiritual traditions who are united in a common goal of bettering human living and lifting us all nearer to the light. The Triangles Network is scintillating with creativity, helping to build a new world over the debris of the old. It is radiating light into the dark corners of the human psyche, exposing the unacceptable thought and desire patterns that humanity has generated over millennia. Never a pleasant experience. But now we can acknowledge them and redeem them. For me, it's these understandings, experiences and recognitions that help put our contemporary anxieties into a better perspective. For in truth, we've discovered something really wonderful. The nearer we approach the light and love of the soul, the more we experience a deep joy. This is a joy which recognizes what has been called the unconquerable nature of goodness and the inevitability of the ultimate triumph of good. Yes, there will be pain on the way to this. Yes, there will be successes and failures, human happiness and sorrows. That is inevitable in a material world as the Buddha taught us two and a half thousand years ago. But deeper than these surface things is the eternal presence of the soul, whose nature is love and whose quality is joy. This loving joy is what motivates us to serve. When we see the kernel of truth in all that we contact, and we automatically choose the truth of the real, then we next learn the lesson of joyful action, and then the path of bliss can open before us. So let us use our triangles meditations to radiate joy for joy lets in the light, joy fires the imagination, joy enlivens our hearts, joy destroys the barriers of separateness in our minds. In fact, joy transforms everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon. So I just had a couple of ponderings that I wanted to see if you could shed <laughs> <laughs> more light on. Um, one of the most uh, touching uh, stories that I've heard about joy, you're probably familiar with it, because it was um, embodied in a poem by, I believe, a British man, but whose name I forget. I didn't look it up before this. <laughs> But it was about uh, an instance during, I believe it was the Second World War, but it could have been the First World War, wherein on Christmas Day, there was a spontaneous uh, soccer game that arose between the Allied and the Axis powers at one of the centers. And um, there was this line in the middle, you know, the Libran line of, uh, boundarylessness, you know, the no man's land as the Tibetan calls it. 
where they could share with one another a game, you know? They could, I, we're told they exchanged gifts. And so I think that there's something to be said for the idea that through the pain and sorrow that is so, so much a part of our planetary life in which we're, we hear about, there's also perhaps on this planet a specific quality of joy that is also part of our keynote. So is there anything you could share about the ability of, of a really tragic and difficult situation to evoke this joy? In human well, it's a, actually, what you're referring to is the First World War. It was the First World War, yeah, okay. And and it was on Christmas Day in the in the trenches. Yes. And the German and the British side tentatively agreed to not shoot each other if they stood up, and they had this famous football match. Yeah. Exchange cigarettes. Uh, yeah. And then the generals were very cross and told them they had to fight. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> and it was like everybody suddenly burst out singing, and that's, I was <laughs> that's Sieg, that Siegfried Sassoon. Yes, it's maybe not a great classic poem, but it's beautiful very, in what it expresses. It's very moving. Yes, and there's an. Um, um, I will see if I can look it up while we're talking. Yeah, there was a. Um, um, I, I was giving a concert in a town called Norwich, where there's a beautiful cathedral. And on, I was spent time looking around the um, cathedral. And there was an altar with a, the prayer from Raven's book, um, which was the most extraordinary thing. How, yes, here we are how even in the worst circumstances, something extraordinary shines through. And it goes like this. O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will, but do not remember all the suffering that they have inflicted on us. Remember the fruits we have brought because of this suffering, our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart that has grown out of all this, and when they come to judgment, let all the free fruits we have borne be their forgiveness. Mm. And that was found on a scrap of paper in Raven's book, Concentration. Mm. Wow. Extraordinary. Yes. So in the darkest, well, it's a famous thing from the I Ching, isn't it? In the darkest time, that's when the light shines. Yes. Mm. So there's also this idea that might be familiar to all those who have studied somewhat the Bailey teachings, but for those who are maybe new to this concept of distinguishing between happiness and joy, could you share any thoughts about, from your own life experience perhaps, of what's the difference between these two? Well, um, I mean, we, we can all talk about happiness. Yeah. And uh, in fact, the American founding father said, you know, the right to life, happiness. Life, life liberty and the pursuit yes. of happiness. Yes, yeah. the pursuit of happiness. And of course, that does not mean the pursuit of pleasure. Right. But the happiness in that sense is much more the happiness and contentment of the, of the alignment with the soul, seems to me. Yeah. And so for a lot of people, happiness means frivolity and um, getting up to what teenagers get up to. <laughs> <laughs> but, and there's nothing wrong with that at all, but it's, it's impermanent. Right. And it's, always, it's balanced by unhappiness. It's a, sort of an emotional roller coaster. Right. But joy is, in my experience, always there as long as you are truly aligned yeah. and it gives you this poise that spiritual poise that never leaves yeah. it's like yeah. it, it's often compared to a bird right it's a, yes. a, a the free the free nature of the bird the symbolism of the bird yes yeah. beautiful 
Well, why don't we just open it up now to, um, can you see the chat box, Simon? Yes. If you'd like to read um, something from the chat box, if there are any comments and anybody who would like to raise their hand by going to the, um, I forget which, the reactions button, you can, uh, we can unmute your microphone and you could start also share that way. And we don't have, we didn't, I forgot to ask you, Simon, for your transcript. Do you happen to have it on hand there and you could you upload it? Do you know how to upload it there? Um, yes, but I'd need to edit it. And oh, okay. Still... We can upload it next week and we can put it on our website. Yeah. Now, so, but if you yeah. send it to me, we'll upload it next week. Okay. Later. I'll do that. Um, Somebody wants to know where that you, you gave that quote about the lion, the roar. Oh, yeah, that came from Destiny of the Nations, um, page, let's see. Um, oh, I don't have the page number, sorry, but it's in Destiny of the Nations. All right. And people in the chat, people are are saying again and again um, about happiness of the personality, joy is from the soul. Yeah, um, but sometimes they can overlap, I would think. <laughs> They're not always separate. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, this sort of idea that the personality is there to be beaten. <laughs> yeah. Is not quite correct. Right. It's, right. it's there to be used, disciplined yeah. and used yeah. joyfully. And happily. Yes. Yes. I, uh, I met somebody not so long ago who said that she'd been told by somebody else, how can you be happy in a world where there's so much suffering? And I replied to her, well, will you being miserable make the world a better place? <laughs> <laughs> Good response. <laughs> what was her and, response? <laughs> <laughs> she laughed. I'm pleased to say she laughed. That's good. That's good. Yeah. And it's good to have you speaking about joy because I do know you personally. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say that you carry that note of joy with you. And it's a oh, beautiful you. quality. Well, I do have my moments though. <laughs> yeah. Yes, like everyone. <laughs> yeah. But, Joy must be very accompanied for you by music because you are a musician and it seems that you when you play it just seems like a joyful release of energies. Do you find it so? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the interesting thing is that if you put yourself up there as the performer and you make yourself centre stage, you lose the spontaneity and joy of the music, mm -hmm. the, per the personality gets in the way yes and you have to have that poise where you put yourself aside and the music comes through you yes and then it works and there's a famous pianist uh, Sviatoslav Richter who mm, yes was phenomenally good and he, I remember reading an interview he gave that out of all the thousands of concerts and recordings and things that he had done he had only achieved that joyful poise twice in his life. But all the other strivings uh, became worth it just for those two moments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure there are some, some pianists who can achieve it, though. It's part of the gift that they're given in the, in yes. the moment of performing, I would think. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the inspiration, right? The inspiration. I don't see any hands raised. Uh, okay. Shy people here. All right. I had a question, Kathy. Okay. I didn't see your hand up there. Sorry. Um, about the Christmas truce, I hadn't studied it in depth, but I wonder if either of you knew uh, some of this, that I think the war came to a close only a few months after that. And one thing that, that came from it is a lot of soldiers just didn't have the will to fight anymore after that. 
and mm -hmm. some people had posited that 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 truce um, sort of led to the 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 close of the First World War. Do you have any thoughts or insights on that? I, I don't think you've got it quite right because the Christmas truce happened shortly after the war began in 1914. Mm. So it went on for another four years. Oh, they must have been mistaken, whoever I was yeah. hearing that from. No, that's all, that's all right. Um, but, you know, put the record straight. Um, are there any other comments you'd like to read, Simon? Um, somebody says, Barbara Foster, I learnt, I know not how or when, that joy is the evidence of the presence of God Hence, we have the connection with Jove and Jovial. And of course, Jove is the Latin name for God. Yeah. Which is a connection I had never thought of before. Lovely. Well, you often feel joy. Uh, earlier when we were speaking, you had your three month old grandson in your arms. We often feel so much joy around children and radiating from children because yes. they're so much freer from personality at a young age, wouldn't you say? That's right. And also yeah. they have so much energy. Yes. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, yes. There's that lovely poem of Wordsworth on the intimations of mort immortality, mm. when he talks about um, the child that yeah. is um, reveling in glory. Yes, and, and nature. Actually, the, the, prison, the prison of personality encloses them around. So when once they become adults, the magic has disappeared. Yes. But I would, I would hope that as the soul takes up more space within the personality, it returns. Uh, in Absolutely. And that's really what our work's all about, isn't it? Right. right. Breaking our chains. Yes. So I see some more comments there, Simon. Yeah. yeah. So I'm saying that one can be in a very dark moment or circumstance and still experience joy. Yeah. It's rather interesting, actually, that the the past, the sort of Piscean time, joy and the spiritual path is associated with suffering. Mm. And, um, you know, the whole of the Christian tradition is that the world is saved through the unmerited suffering of the perfect human being. Yeah. And... Uh, I think that actually the future to which we're all, for which we're all working, that will change. Yeah. I, I, I think joy will be the keynote, yes. not suffering. Yes. And, uh, you know, this, I suppose suffering and pain have done their work. Yes. And if we take advantage of it, we can go forward into this what I think is a better world. Yeah. If we don't learn the lesson, we'll be trapped in that condition of perpetual suffering, which I don't think anybody wants. No. Yeah, I remember a, a quote or a, a passage in DK where he does say precisely that, that we're moving out of that suffering of Christ and we're moving yes. into a time when joy and strength That's will right. be the keynotes. That's yeah. right. That's right. Strength through joy, you know? Yes. Beautiful to think of. And it starts with children. It seemed like, you know, he was saying that the, the Nazis sort of perverted the idea by having these training sessions and camps for, right. to, to inculcate these ideas to the young, yeah. but we need to do that for the children today, have the opportunity to cultivate joy in our educational systems. Mm -hmm. a, a very interesting aspect of that is that 
um, the happiest children I know are the children who are not glued to their smartphones. Or exactly. Devices. Exactly. And, and it's, it's up to the parents. That's up to the yeah. parents. But it's interesting that these instruments, which actually bring us all together, and we wouldn't be able to have this webinar without it, yes. are also dividing ourselves off into little bubbles of yes. self-centeredness. Yeah. I saw a cartoon that illustrates that. The mother said to her son, go out and play. And then you see the kid sitting on the steps with his computer <laughs> outside. <laughs> I don't think that's what she had in mind, okay. but uh, yeah. It's another another cartoon, which you know that car, um, graphic of the the ascent of man, and it's a sort of um, quadruped, and then gradually it comes through the ape, and then starts to walk more and more erect until eventually it becomes a human being. And then this cartoon took that further, and this human being suddenly starts stooping over his <laughs> on a computer. <laughs> so, there's the descent of man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Somebody makes a nice comment here, Matthew Martin. The server must see a difficulty as it truly is. Absolutely right. And aspire to solve it in order to receive an intuition or insight into actually how to do it, how to solve it. Somebody's mentioned the um, Ode to Joy mm. by Schiller. Now, there's an interesting story because that was at the beginning of the 19th century. Mm. And it, I have read something, and I've never been able to find out if it's true or not, that Schiller really wrote the Ode to Freedom. Mm. And the word freedom and joy, joy is Freude and freedom is Freiheit, mm. I think. And so he wrote it to joy because that was uncontroversial and it would get past the censors. Mm. But what he really meant was freedom. Uh, yeah. And when the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, Leonard Bernstein gave a concert of the Beethoven Ninth Symphony, and he changed the word from joy to freedom wow. in that performance. Nice. So whether that's what Beethoven intended and Schiller intended, mm. Bernstein did it, which mm. is lovely. Wow. And where did, he perform, where did he perform that piece? I, don't, I can't remember. Yeah. I have to look it up. But the, the point is also that, of course, joy and freedom are so mutually inclusive. Yes, yes, yeah. Like that symbol for the fourth ray of the rosy cross overshadowed by the golden bird, you know, yes. just the yes. bird flying freely. Yes. Above the personality, what the loved, those things yes. that are loved in the world, but the freedom of the soul is flying free. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Simon, it's coming towards the hour and we usually close at this point and I really hope to have you back again soon and to continue our conversations with you <laughs> and your wisdom oh. and your joy. Oh, yes. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Yeah. Not just you, but with everybody. Yes. So let's just everybody take a moment of silence to a link up with each other and with the worldwide group visualizing the triangles network surrounding the planet.
Thank you, everyone. We'll see you again.